All right, let's get it, man. Let's bring it on to a close. This is part four. This is the, uh, you know, final part of this uh, series. All praise for why. You know, I did not uh, expect to kind of, you know, take this turn. I had some other things I wanted to do first, but I'm so grateful that we, uh, you know, can be uh, can be water together. You know what I mean? It's important not to try to do too much planning, but just to, you know, find your flow and trust yourself. You know what I mean? You are validated. Stay on your path if you feel like everything's, you know what I'm saying, closing in on you right now and this, this, and that. Man, we're being tested, man. You know what I mean? This is the final, you know, final leg, man. Y'all gotta, you gotta, you know, pick up everything you can, man. You know, everything you feel like you drop, pick it up, man. You know what I mean? Dodge all hijacks. Pick up every piece of yourself. Put yourself back together. Keep your head up. Look up to Hawa. Know that you exist. I know you feel like you're cracking in this system, man, because you're not, you don't belong here. You don't belong in it. So, yeah, it's going to be real fucked up for you, man. Real fucked up for you, man. But it ceases to be, you know what I'm saying, something impossible. When you know that there's a wave to surf that validates you. You know what I'm saying? This is more than information, man. This is a feeling. This is a vibration. So I appreciate y'all for surfing with me. You know what I mean? You ain't got to like every part of this. You ain't got to like every part of me. <laughs> you ain't got to like every part of whatever, man. But, you know what I'm saying? Just uh, you know, just know I appreciate you, man. Um, because the energy is real. The oneness is real. And, uh, you know, there is no other way but to, uh, you know, unite to be united is the only cause, is the only, is the only source, is our unity, our unity is the only source, man, so, Mosak, the founder, man, we're talking about the source of the foundation legend, we're talking about their, uh, Caesar's Messiah versus, uh, the real spill, so whether we're talking Joshua or Moses or Elijah or all these things, whether you're talking New Testament remix with the Flavius and the Pisos and all that remix, man, you know that there's a foundation legend. So we got, you know, pieces of this. I want to finish reading it so we can uh, finish out uh, the last bit of that documentary that we're in, man, and just, you know, take it on home, man. Shabbat Shalom. This is a beautiful time to rest. It's a beautiful time to rest. To renew, to get your weapon, to get your nourishment, get that food, man. Get in the classrooms, relax. Mosak, 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 the founder, Moshe. They're hiding Moses <laughs> right there, and they're dealing with it, man. It's not like you know what I'm saying. You know when something's completely fake, and then you know when it's like, damn, well, clearly this shit can't be fake because they swept it under the rug, like. We see the foundation legend, we see the traces, we see the name of the city, we see all the things they're hiding. They're not they're not giving this to us. They're not pushing this to us. We're not getting this out of our history book. That's how we know it's not a part of their spell, or else this will be something that is not forgotten. But as we have read about Mosak the founder. So you got the original city mentioned Mazaka, became Caesarea or Kazaria. They call him Mosak, the founder of the Cappadocians. Mosak, an intriguing primal ancestor. His name suggests some sort of Shemitic derivation. We're talking about Mazaka. We're talking about the Byzantine. We're talking about Turkey, now called Constantinople. We're talking about the Cappadocians. And we got to dig on it. Now, it says he has a Shemitic derivation and his reputation as the founder of the Cappadocians seems to hint at a foundation legend for the region that was older than the adoption of Greek myths. So this region is older than all of their hijack. You got to dig on it and you got to know that there's jewels. There's there's some babies in this bathwater. We're getting the babies out the bathwater. We're getting the Mosak out of the water, the Moshe out of the water. He was a baby in the water before he was rescued out the water. And now we continue to rescue Mosak out of the water. We're talking our intriguing primal ancestor of the copper color American. 
His name suggests Shemite derivation. Now, unfortunately, he remains completely obscure, right? Philostrogius, Philo Philo, is in fact, in fact, knew so little about the legend that he could not match up the consonants and the vowels in order to make sense of the postulated etymological link between the city's name of Mazaka and Mosak's name. So he shrugged and invented a makeshift phonetic transfer. Damn, we're just talking duplicates and phantoms, right? Get part one, two, three. We're talking duplicates. So Philo, Philo, all right, these are their theologians, theologians. So he shrugged and invented a makeshift phonetic transfer, just like your makeshift timeline. After the passage of time, the city was called Mazaka through a swerving, a swerving, a twist. Through a swerving, they called it Mazaka. How much have they swerved on you, so-called Negro? In the latter Roman Empire, all that survived of whatever legends there may have been about Mosak or Moses. So their Christianity... Their agenda destroyed the memory, destroyed your memory, your foundation legend. Now you hear about priest king Preston John in the 1100s and 1200s and 1300s, this title being passed that really extends way back into the lands that we've been rocking on. We're talking America that's sandwiched in between this Atlantis and this Moo Lemuria and all that. So... We have a very treasured spot here, and they just found it, man, through a swerving. So all that survived from this Roman Empire, this Christianity, this spread of the swerving, whatever legend there may have been about Mosak, Moses, were his name. The only thing that survived were his name. So you still know the name today, right? That survived. His reputation, well, that's all over the place, right? But they uh, syncretize it, they take from it, they, they switch it up. His reputation and his obscure connection with the name of the city. So that survives because there's still an obscure connection that in their, you know what I'm saying, philosophical circles, they're still trying to figure out the obscurity. The myth. They say of Mosak, the founder, the founder. He's called the founder. We're talking priest kings. Was a lost memory. Mosak, the founder, Moses, the founder, was a lost memory. The founder of this area. What was the Byzantine Empire really? What was the Kremlin really? What were they really before they were hijacked and put in your history books? So the reality of Moses, the founder, was a lost memory, a fragment of an abandoned past, a casualty of the adoption of Greek mythology or the imposition of Roman rule or the expansion of Christianity. <laughs> All the same damn hijack mixed up rebranded in a Greek, Roman, or Christian society. Moses, the founder, Mosad, the founder, has become meaningless. He means nothing to you anymore. You're just looking for Caesar's Messiah now. Christian bishops like Basil had introduced new patterns of hierarchy, so new patterns came in. A new expectations of behavior for local communities, so they had new behavior. Because those new patterns conflicted with established behavior and traditional expectations, churchmen reinterpreted both the natural landscape, reinterpreted the natural landscape. What happens when you reinterpret something that's natural? What happens when you swerve a natural lane? Natural landscape is now being reinterpreted. Man, get in the bro Hiram arts classroom. I've been told y'all that. He's breaking down the national parks, man. 59 national parks, 700 million plus acres. 
of your land in a federal trust. We're talking about reinterpretation of your natural landscape and history itself in order to link this morality with much larger tradition. Even though they wrote in classic, classic, classicizing and anticizing Greek, they did not locate their new interpretations in Greek myths and Roman history. Instead, they focused on biblical and Christian history. Their interpretations linked their communities with ecclesiastical history back to Zeus, back to Jesus. So their interpretations, right? Their reinterpreting of your natural landscape that has more to do with you, more to do with reinterpreting you, so their interpretations linked their communities with ecclesiastical history back to Jesus with biblical history back into the Old Testament and even with creation itself. All this linking, all this falsified connecting to reinterpret you. Local legends that had situated communities in Greek and Roman history were hence lost. The local legends. Who are the local legends? Who are the local legends? Let's see. Who's, uh, you know, images keep popping up when they keep digging anywhere. Giant heads looking like you. Landmarks for land rights. You see you on these walls and these caves. Your writings. Your energy, your frequency, you're the local legend. Legend means we're still talking about you. You just didn't know it. Or well, now we're finally kind of coming to focus on this thing and like, hmm. It's legendary and no one else fits it but the Negro who's asleep right now. Instead, they focused on biblical and Christian history. Their interpretations link their communities with ecclesiastical history back to Jesus, with biblical history back into the Old Testament, and even with creation itself. Local legends that had situated communities in Greek and Roman history were hence lost. At best, they remain curiosities. Oh, curiosities. Local legends remain curiosities, and that's why I'm holding a book. <laughs> that's why I'm holding this book. An inquiry into the distinctive characteristics because you're curious. They're curious about where you came from and who you are. So you are the local legend that is now a curiosity or you're lost. Local legends became lost or at least remained a curiosity. I got a book published in the British Library. An inquiry into the distinctive characteristics of the aboriginal race of America. An inquiry into the distinctive characteristics. Distinctive characteristics. They're inquiring into your distinctive characteristics here in America. Because you are a local legend. And now you're at least a curiosity. Occasionally collected by ethnographers or historians. Occasionally they dig on you, right? A miniature version of this entire process was to change the names of Kazaria Bezos Episcopal C. So that's their C, their Papal C. So they rule by the law of the C because it's all about the C, not the land. They have to hijack land. The C is just theirs. They feel like they can just go everywhere in the sea. Any land they find, they change the names, titles, remix them, reinterpret them. Enslave the people, parasites. The original name of the city had been Mazaka, somehow derived from the name of Mosak, the founder. During the Hellenistic period, the kings of Cappadocia had renamed the city with a respectable Greek name, Eusebia, piety. This, re this renaming presumably reflected their goal of introducing Greek culture and amenities of a proper Greek city. <laughs> proper. Oh, now it's, oh, we're going to colonize and, you know what I'm saying? That's how they think. Oh, now it's proper for us. Now it's in our frequency. We can live here. At the end of the first century BC, Archelaus 
The last of the Cappadocian kings had renamed the city again as Khazaria in order to honor the emperor Caesar, Caesar, Augustus. Archelaus himself was hailed as a founder. So now you got Archelaus as the founder, not Moses, not Mosak anymore, right? And Khazaria had become a proper city in the Roman Empire. In the 4th century, Bishop Basil found a, founded a new city in the suburbs of Khazaria or Mosak or Mazaka that included a church, a clerical residence, a poorhouse, and a hospital. Rather than simply renaming Khazaria, Basil had founded a replacement settlement of Vatican, a Vatican outside the city's walls. Uh-oh. The name for this new foundation was not so surprising. <laughs> Basilius, Basil's place. <coughs> so again, they're naming all this stuff after themselves. Because, you know, they want you to be obscure or at least a, a curiosity. So it says Mazaka, Eusebia, Kazaria, Basialius. Each new name was an entire history in one word. And as a community changed its name and its and its cults, it changed its local history and its local legends. In each new name, the city had also had to acknowledge a new founder or e eponymous hero. Eponymous hero, Mosak. A Hellenistic king of Cappadocia, <laughs> a Roman emperor. The next member of the series was a Christian bi was a Christian bishop. All right. By the late latter fourth century, Basil was hailed as the second founder and protector, and the guardian and patron of the city. Legends about him now define his community. So they'll make Moses a Christian. They'll make David a Christian. They'll do whatever they can to fit into their reinterpretation. To keep you lost so that you remain a curiosity. Philostrosis deserves credit for breaking away from this powerful mythology about the significance about the signi significance of Basil. His curiosity was a valuable attribute, especially for historians, since it made him inquisitive as well as crucial critical. Reinforcing this inherent skepticism was a sense of grievance about the treatment of Yanamius, Basil, and Gregory of Nyssa had re reviled, reveled Eunomius and his theological doctrines. In contrast, Philostrogius made a pilgrimage to visit his hero in his retirement on a Cappadocian estate. Philostrogius then wrote his ecclesiastical history. So what are you reading today? You're reading, you're in the mind of a hijack. Philostrogius wrote, then wrote his ecclesiastical history in part to defend you know me, it's his reputation, and to criticize Basil's behavior. So this is their little infighting. As one later Byzantine reader noted with both horror and fascination, this history was a eulogy for heretics. Philostrogia was hence a heredox Christian who wrote a heredox history. He had clearly not followed the new orthodoxy either about theology or about history, even when so these are the people writing your history man i mean you got your your timelines your your scaliger patavius you know what i'm saying for uh and i told you for the mancos breaking that down with the scaliger patavius timeline they're putting their names on the time it's my time it's scaliger's time now they're putting their history on you it's philostrogius's history he had clearly not followed the new orthodoxy either about theology or about history, even when writing about his own homeland of Cappadocia and adjacent regions, he broke ranks. Gregory of Nyssa had rewritten the history. Damn. So Gregory then re rewrote his own history of Pontus in order to highlight the significance of Gregory. Thamutaragus. Philostrogius seems not to have mentioned either Gregory Theomatogos or Gregory of Nyssa. Basil's supporters had not been reluctant to rearrange the past to correspond to their vision. If you're a Christian today, you have to weigh all of this, weigh all of these things, weigh where you're getting these interpretations and know that 
you're in an illusion, you're in a mind of a hijack. You only connect to your creator hijack free because you were brought here hijack free. You got your energy. The creator breathed into you, your spirit, your sinew, your ruah. Your framer and shaper gave you direct energy. You don't go back through anybody. You go back directly. Adam, you're crystallized. With your source. Other than that, you're in somebody else's interpretation and vision. Basil supporters have not been reluctant to rearrange the past. They rearranged you, Negro. They rearranged the past to correspond to their vision of a better future. And they had emphasized the significance of the Basalius for Kazaria and Basil's own reputation in Cappadocia. Philostrogius was simply a better historian than that. Realizing that the entire past was relevant for interpreting the past, he preferred to mention Mosak, the founder, and Mazaka. So he at least preferred to mention. He still did his own hijack, but he at least preferred to mention Mosak, the founder, and Mazaka, the region's original founder in the city's or original name, even if the shards of their memories left him puzzled about the connections. So he at least dared to, you know what I'm saying, you know, shed some of the uh, drop on it. Rather than wanting to forget old legends about Cappadocia, Philostrogius struggled to recollect and record them. He was still trying to remember the past. So these are all the branches, you know what I'm saying? You got, you know, Philo branching out of, you know what I'm saying? Whatever, then they got the orthodoxies and then they branch out of these orthodoxies and then they go into their own thing and then some of them, are a little more reluctant to be complete hijacks. Some of them say, you know what, I want to try to put a little more drop in it, man. I'm going to at least mention Mozart. I'm going to at least acknowledge that there's a connection, even if I can't really put it all together. So what are we talking about? We're talking Mesek. We're talking Mozart. All right. Again, much of modern Russia, parts of modern Georgia, modern, modern, Rus, Georgia, exilarchs, exile, in the Caucasus region, Huns and ancient Mazaka, Mosak, Mosakshi, Mosak, Moshi, Moshi, Maska, and Maskavi. And Cappadocia, Moscow reflects the old name, possibly migration as far as South America. Migration as far as South America. We're talking about Mazaka and Mosat, possibly the Moshe and cultures in South America. Moshe, Mosat, Meshesh. You take out the vowels, you still get whether it's Mosat, Meshesh. Cultures in South America, we're talking about the Mexica, Mexico, 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 Mexico is Moses. What did Josephus say? So was the entire nation once called. So now you have this huge nation of Mexico. You got this huge Moscow with, with the Rus and the Russia. You're connecting the Ruses, the Rosses, the Picts. They're all Picts. They're all kings, priests. Of the creator, whatever name you want to give him. Much of northern Russia, Moscow, and the region Muscovy. Alright, man. So we gotta get on this Muscovy, right? We got to get on this Muscovy. Cause something's going down with this Muscovy. I mean, what did Graham Hancock tell us about this Muscovy? All right, man, Drop's going to get some sleep after this, man. Four-part series, man. That's six hours of unexpected drop, you know what I'm saying? But I know that uh, you, you're going to take it because a lot of us are going through a lot of this hijack, you know, especially in our families, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot going on, and this hijack keeps popping up, man. So, you know, we got to put the attention, man, where, you know, where it's needed. And devouring hijack is what we do. A lot of us are being hijacked by the same Zeus, the same energy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're trying to stay healthy, man. 
got to get that rest though, man. So, you know, Drop's going to get some rest, man, for a couple days, if y'all don't mind, man. Let's finish this up, man. So, what were the Meseks? Meshek. Mesek. Moses. Meshek. All right. Where's that Graham Hancock? There we go. All right, so I'll get there. I'll do it just like this. Do I have any, uh, two of them up? Oh, I got two of those joints. Here we go. All right. So what were the Meshechs? It says the Meshechs. Meshech. Meshechs. Moshach. Meshi. Meshi. Meshech. Meshiko. All right. Were the slaves of the Phoenicians. Hmm. Now you hear Phoenicians, you know what I'm saying, linked to a lot of things. You hear them linked to Canaanites. You hear them linked to this, linked to that. You hear them linked to Egyptians. Let's surf the Egypt wave. So the Moses or the Meshech or the Moshi or the Meshi people. <clears throat> or Muscovy were the slaves of the Phoenicians or the Egyptians. But they were glorified slaves. Hmm. Glorified slaves. Now it says their job is to procure and oversee slaves for the Phoenicians, but you know, of course, they're gonna, you know what I'm saying guess at what they think their job is during slavery as if they know what these glorified slaves glorified slaves you know what i'm saying these are people that have never been in captivity that now oh they're slaves they're glorified slaves matter of fact you know what they had to do you know what i'm saying so that's when when these researchers go crazy because they write about shit that they don't know about they may hear oh their job was doing this you can't tell you can't tell someone the job of every single individual slave of these tribes. Oh, every single, every single tribal brother had to procure and oversee slaves for Phoenicians. You know what I'm saying? It gets ridiculous. So we dodged a hijack. I mean, maybe some were, but come on, man. As a whole, <laughs> so teach them skills such as metal and gold working. All right. So they were teaching them skills, metal, gold working, other crafts. All right. They also bought and sold manufactured goods for the Phoenicians. So all these are encompassed in this captivity that they're calling glorified. Again, this is a Graham Hancock drop. You know, sometimes, man, you know what I'm saying? These cats come up with a couple of things that we can get some babies out. Glorified, all right. What does the word Mesek mean? In the Aramaic language, the Phoenicians generally spoke Mashika. Mesek, we know we're not talking about Japheth, even though Josephus tried to fit him in. Mazaka, Mosak, Mas, Moshi, Mashi, Maska, Maskavi. We're about to get on that. We're talking about the now dead Mashika languages in Peru, which is Jerusalem. Here. So these languages spoken in Jerusalem are now dead. Surf the way. Mashika, the real word. The real word for Meshe is Mashika, means Messiah. Messiah. In Turkish, a similar word means Messi or Meshe. Meshi, Meshiko, Messiah. Meshi, Meshiko, Messiah. We're talking about your Messiah, not Caesar's Messiah. This is part four, the finale. I mean, what did Josephus say? Where's that drop, man? What did Josephus say, man? Get out the library. Let's go. 
This is chapter 6, book 1, chapter 6, The Antiquity of the Jews, Flavius Josephus. He tried to fit this in. He comes out of nowhere after talking about Thobo and the Thobolites. He talks about and the Masakini. So he comes out of nowhere. Were founded by Mosak, the founder. Now they are Cappadocians. There is also a mark, a sign, a tau, a cross, a cross, a cross that has to do with a Messiah. For those that are able to overstand. There is a mark, a sign of their ancient denomination. We just read Mosach is the primal, your primal ancestor. You know what I'm saying? Your, your first, your, your Messiah. Ancient denomination still to be shown. So this is futuristic. You're just getting this drop. It hadn't happened yet. Because it was still to be shown. Because that's how good they did a job of hiding it. And Flavius sure did uh, take the cake. For there is now even, for there is even now among them a city called Mazaka. This is Flavius's. We just got it separately out of another source. The making of Christian communities. With Grand Hancock's drop. Oh, we go back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going we gonna to get back on this Arebi, Arebi, because we're just talking timelines, right? All right, man. We're just talking Mesek, right? And this is out the Tower of Babel, the cultural history of our ancestors by Baj Hodge. So, Bodhi Hodge, all this coming together, all these sources saying the same thing. What are we saying? The real word for this Mashika, Mesek, means Messiah, all right? Messiah. What did Graham Hancock say? Or actually, what did Flavius say? The city's now called Mazaka. There is a mark of their ancient denomination still to be shown for those, for there is even now among them a city called Mazaka, which which now became Kazaria and Constantinople, right? Which may inform those, which may inform those that are able to understand. Make sure, make sure you can get all this, man. Pause it, read it, do what you got to do. Uh, 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 okay, here we go. Get it all. Take your time. We're not in no rush, man. Which may inform those that are able to understand. So there's a mark on this, this tribe, this tribe of Moses, this ancient denomination. There's a mark. There is a Mashiach. There is a Mashiach, which may inform those that are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called. So there's a city among them called Mazaka, which may inform those that are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called. So you have an entire nation called Meshi, Meshiko. You have an entire nation over there, you know, named after Moscow and Russia. Then you got the, the Mazaka all throughout the Byzantine. And it seems like the whole damn thing was named after Mosak. The founder. It seems like the whole damn thing was Moses, man. When you really look at it. Now you got the Joshua following following suit. Mosach is an intriguing primal ancestor. Well, I'll say Mosach is an intriguing primal ancestor. His name suggests some sort of shamanic derivation and his reputation as the founder of the Cappadocian seems to hint at a foundational legend for the region that was older than the Greek hijack myth. Unfortunately, he remains completely obscure. Man. 
Mossack, the founder, had become meaningless. He's become meaningless in your conscience. Graham Hancock's talking about the Meshika, the word, real word for Meshek. Meshek means Messiah. Now, we also mentioned this uh, Muscovy. Much of the northern region, Moscow in the region, Muscovy. We also got the Mashi, Moscow, and Muscovy. Now, we know we're talking America, so now we think, hmm. What does that got to do with America, Graham Hancock? <laughs> because the Messex, remember, they're, they're, they're the slaves of the Phoenician, right? Because the Messex, Messex were good slaves, lovingly working themselves to death for their Phoenician masters. Wow. Seems when you follow the slave trail, you keep connecting to the so-called Negro. Copper color race found here. And if we're only talking Muscovy and Michiokan, let's get it. Because we're just talking Muscovy and Michiokan. We of the Americas know them as Mashika. This is Graham Hancock's drop, man. Not mine. We're just putting it together. Mexican, Mexica. So we of the Americas know them as Mexica, Mexican. Mexica is their neutral name. And Michoacan of Mexico. Right there in your face bone. I didn't have to go far. Because when you talk Muscogee, Muscogee you're also talking Muscogee, Muscogee. Muscogee and love to the family man Albert Thompson man that's connected that obviously with our tribes coming out of Georgia you know what I mean and all that man so we're right here our Meshi Meshi Moses Mozak the founder Meshi Meshi Okan possibly the Moshe and cultures in South America and the now dead Mashika languages in Peru. Moscow reflects the old name, possibly migration as far as South America. We of the Americas know them as Mashika, Mexican, Mexica is their new to name, indigenous name. And Meshi Okan, right? Now you got Michigan. Detroit, Michigan is Meshi Okan. That's Mexico. That's that's Moses. That's Meshi. That's Meshi. That's Moses Khan. We're only talking the Khan dynasty. The fiery, flying, flaming dragon that devours the venomous serpents. In Mexico, Moshe or Mashika in Peru. Wait. Moshika languages in Peru. Moshe. <laughs> Josephus is hiding Moses, man. There is also a mark on their ancient denomination still to be shown. For there is even among them now a city called Mazaka, which may inform those that are able to understand, overstand that so was the entire nation once called. Here. So you got Mosquito, right? In Nicaragua. Moshe. Mo you follow the mosque. And all that stuff is the same. You're looking for the traces of Moses. You're looking for the job. You're getting Moses out the water. The babies out the bath water. Here in the United States, they are called Muskegon, right? Muscovy, Muskegon, Muskogee. Michigan, Michigan, Mojica. Wow. So you got the Mohicas, right? Last, you know what I mean? 
last, the last Mohican, all that is the tribes of Moses. And that connects to Prester John and digging on the tribes of Moses. The Hopis are also known as Moki, Makis. Their original myths speak of Muske, Muski, Muski, Muscavi, Muski, where they live. We're talking about Meshi, Mexica, Mexico. The Mexicanos of Mexico are especially interesting. Hmm. The word Meshiokan surely derives from the so-called Turkic Meshek Khan. You think this is play play? I just told you. Meshiokan. This Khan's originally the C A N. The word Meshiokan surely derives from Meshek Khan. <laughs> Wow. Or Mesic Conate Kingdom. <laughs> I can't make this shit up, man. Damn. Uh, you know, you dig on it. You dig on it. You dig on it, man. The Mexicans of Mexico are especially interesting. The word Mexican surely derives from the what they're calling Turkic, but we dodged the hijack. We know that it's Meshi, Meshek, Messiah, right? We're talking Muscagi. <laughs> what does Meshek mean? Meshika, the word Meshek means Messiah. You're talking your Messiah, not Caesar's Messiah. Your Messiah, not Caesar's Messiah. And now we're talking about the, the Messiah Khan, right? The priest, the priest the king. The priest king, Prester John. Another Prester John. In Meshek Khanate Kingdom. The Mesicanate Kingdom. You know, we're going to get right back in it. But when you dig on Hong Kong or Wong Kong, Prester John. I know this is pretty small. I'll read it to you. I'll leave you the link. You're talking Wong Khan and Karyats in what they're calling the Mongol Empire. Remember your chronology and you remember the Dodge to Hijack. We're talking about this invasion of Genghis Khan, and just like we dug on that Kalelus and the uh, Theodorus and the Solomon the Builder, you know what I'm saying, the empire being split up, you also have it being split up by this Khan, right, this Genghis Khan. You know what I mean? All of these are a connected family, and it's the same story. It's the same story. Genghis Khan invades, you know what I'm saying, but it's family on family, right? The Israelite Empire split apart. Family on family is warring, right? Now you have Columbus coming over here looking for the Grand Khan in Cuba, which is called Hawa Hawa, the Israelite king across from Prester John. Well, you have a couple of priest kings now here, right? So now you have this Khan that has already invaded because he's part of the family. He, he, he wants to move in now, right? So he now moves in. Now he's here. Columbus is coming here and his family's already here and now he's looking for the Khan, but the Khan at this time is a hijack Khan. Does that sound familiar? You know what what happened with the Inca and the Montezumas? They became hijacked. Now you got a hijack Khanate, a Khanate kingdom here. We're just talking Preston John. Wan Khan, Wan Khan, Hong Khan, Hong Khan, Wan Khan. Juan Khan as Prester John. Now they're writing about this and talking about this in the 15th century, which is the 1400s, man. What happened with Columbus, man? Tagrul Juan Khan is his name. Tagrul Juan Khan is the title. His name was Togrul. Juan Khan is the title. Togrul is another of his names, or you can call him David. King David. Was the son of Kur 
Korokakus, Korokakus, by Nima Kutun, reigned from 1160s to 1204. Remember the hijack. So this just happened. We're talking 1204. Now what happened? His palace was located in present-day Ulaanbaatar, and he became blood brother to Yesugwe. Genghis Khan called him Khan Estek, Etsek, meaning Khan Father. So Genghis Khan is calling him the Khan Father. He's calling Priest King Presta John, King David, Khan Father. Since the Tartars rebelled against the Jin Dynasty, man, we gotta dig that up because that was from 1115 to 1234, the Jin Dynasty. In 1195, the Jin commander sent an emissary to Tamujin, who is Genghis Khan. A fight with the Tartars broke out, and the Karyat Mongol alliance defeated them. In 1196, the Jin dynasty awarded Tagrul the title of Wang, which means king. Priest, king. Wang means king. To Tagrul Khan's pleasure, after this, Tagrul was recorded under the title Wang Khan. And again, we're talking Prester John. And even today, they have a Jewish sect called the Karyat, and they're just emulating this Hebrew, this Hebrew tribe of Karyats that are connected to Prester John. And every time you deal on Prester John, you only got to ask yourself one question, man. We'll be right back in this series. <laughs> you only gotta ask yourself one question when it comes to Presser John. And one question only, baby. Did a black man, <laughs> did a copper color man discover the fountain of youth? Because you're only talking Prester John, Priest King, El Prester Juan, and this is what he looking like. Priest King, King David, look familiar. Priest King, King David, does he look familiar? Under the title Priest King or Prester John, they're also trying to make him a Mongol in history. They're rewriting history, right? They're trying to make him a Mongol by calling him what? Wang Khan, right? So let's get it. So we're talking about the Mesek Moses Khanate Kingdom and the Ma. Mexicanos. They are also called Tarasco. We'll be right back in this Tarasco, man. We had mentioned it briefly. Oh, man. So this is going to tie into this Tarasco drop that's coming out the Forbidden History. I'll be right back with part eight of that. Man, we're talking about the conquest of the Mexicanos. So all this is coming together. All this is wrapping around Meshi, Meshi, your Messiah, not Caesar's Messiah, man. So we got the drop. We know we're getting it, man. We know it's real. We know the hijack is real, you know, but only in the illusion as the hijack exists. You know, it's only real, you know what I mean, when it continues to, you know what I'm saying, knock you off of your particular rhythm. But soon you're going to have a frequency and a rhythm that's above all this static, man. I promise you that. So let's try to finish this out, man. Caesar's Messiah, the Roman conspiracy to event Jesus or Hail Zeus. Let's go. Get him, man. Get this out the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still beating our war drums, man. We ain't never stop. Let's go. But Josephus defines who these devils are. He states that the devils are those individuals who have a rebellious spirit and rebel against Rome. At Gadara, Jesus encounters one man who has a legion of demons inside his mind. They then are driven out by Jesus. They infect a herd of swine, and then this herd rushes wildly into the water. This is a parallel to Titus's battle at Gadara, where one individual infects an entire legion 
of Jews with his demonic spirit and then that group in turn infects another group and this combined group is driven by the Romans into the sea. What's being suggested here is that this story that you find in the Gospels is in some ways sort of like a, a grim parable about that military event. It's sort of like a bit tongue-in-cheek, I think. The Romans had a vicious sense of humour like this, a very black sense of humour. Black. In a medieval text that I've studied, which is called the Gospel of Barnabas, when you read that story, the way it's presented is in an unsophisticated form, that is to say it's sort of been decoded in some ways, and it, it becomes clear that, what's, uh, that uh, what we're talking about here are um, the Jewish rebels are chased into the sea, and they drown in the sea. In the Gospels... Right quick. Just, you know, just right quick, man. Just something kind of hit me. When we're talking these... Uh, these 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 Mashikas and these Muscovies, right? These these Muscogies, right? Muski, Muscavi, Muscogi. We're talking the Muscavi. Much of the northern what they're calling Russia and the Georgia there, right? We're talking they say parts of modern Georgia. We're thinking Russia and Georgia. When these Muscovy people, Muscovy or Muscogee people are coming out of this Georgia here in America, we're talking about our indigenous American tribes. Whoa, something starts to light up, right? Because you have a Georgia here and a Georgia there. Duh, right? <laughs> it's like, no shit. So these Meshi coming out, these, these Mexica, these Muscogee coming out of this Georgia here, we're talking about these indigenous tribes, these copper color races found here. Then you got a Georgia there with some Meshi people. So are we saying that there's Meshi people in that Georgia and this Georgia? Are we saying that this is the real Georgia? With these people, they say modern Rush, modern Georgia. Are we just referring to Georgia over there in Russia or are we talking to our Georgia indigenously, man? So these Georgias play, man. We're talking about the Babylonian exilarchs. You know, we're talking about uh, Raja Hiraja Chola. Matter of fact, let me get it. Babylonian exilarchs, right? They also call, right? So you just heard him referred to as Wong Khan. Talking Preston John Priest King, it's just the title. We're talking Exilarch. Exilarch means that they're ruling during the time of captivity. That during this time of what they're calling Babylonian and Georgia captivity. We're talking the Meshi, Muscavi, Muscagi in indigenous Georgia. Georgia's named after this King George, who's also a Hebrew. Melanated king. So you got this David, or what they're saying here. He's the son of Raja Hiraja Chola II, Jadaran, Emperor of Soli, Prester John. So this David is the son of Prester John, which makes Prester John a David, or a Khan, or a Wan Khan, a priest king. That goes under different names. We're talking the Exilarchs. We're talking Solomon, Sali, Soli, David, Sosland, Babylon, and Georgia. So which Georgia? We know our Exilarchs refer to Israelite priest kings. Now, let's get back into this Caesar's Messiah. Let's go. These are presented as pigs. This is a, this is a, uh, once again, a very dark black sort of Roman sense of humor. Some of this literature really needs to be understood like that. In Josephus' biography, he describes when he was in the entourage of Titus during the closing stages of the siege of Jerusalem, he chanced upon three of his friends who were being crucified and he pleaded with Titus for their release. And Titus gave that permission, and the three figures were removed from the cross, 
two of them died and one revived. Wow. Now, if you're looking for a stereotypic example of how some idea was floated into the mind of someone writing the Gospels, that is a pretty clear example. It's certainly a strange occurrence that we find such an incident in the works of Josephus when it shows up in such a dramatic form in the Gospels. Bang. In the Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea asked the Roman commander to take Jesus down from the cross. In Josephus's history, Joseph Barmathias asked the Roman commander to take someone down from the cross. Arimathea is a pun on Josephus's last name, Barmathias. When you read our sources really carefully, and you have to do it really, really carefully, because uh, they didn't spell it out for us. It's, uh, it's effectively very well hidden. Um, we have to understand that our literature, a lot of our literature is essentially propaganda. The Romans are not writing objective history, and all of our literature has been through Roman filters. Perhaps that's the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that uh, this is literature that hasn't been through the Roman filters. It's important to realize that Josephus wrote in an era when allegory was regarded as a science. Educated readers were expected to be able to see another meaning in religious texts than the one that appeared in the surface narration. We're dealing with Roman literature on the one hand and Jewish literature on the other, and it has to be said that in both cases, they're much more sophisticated, much more multi-layered and allusive and much trickier than modern readers suspect. No, it's not a simple literature. It's very, very complex allegorical literature that indulges in the literary games that the Romans played. The more you understand about Roman literature in this period, and then you place the Gospels and other Christian literature in that same milieu, and you can start to see the games that are being played in that literature. Now these parallels have been seen by other scholars, but what they failed to notice is that they occur in the same sequence, and thereby they create a typologic pattern. The Flavian thesis, it's trying to read these texts in context, because in any given text, you've got the text in the first instance, and then you've got the context, the environment in which it happened, and of course in all of these texts also you've got a subtext. So you've got text, context, and subtext, and you have to be able to read all of those things. And unfortunately, many religious people who are coming out of seminaries, who are coming out of religious colleges, they're just not being trained in this sort of uh, level of reading. They're instead being trained to just read on one level, which is a literal level, and uh, I think that that's very unfortunate and that that really needs to be challenged. By studying the multiple layers in these ancient texts in the original Greek language, Joseph Atwell was able to discover not just a handful, but over 40 typological parallels between the Gospels and the works of Josephus, which show that the ministry of Jesus Christ followed in exact sequence the military campaign of Titus Flavius. Bang. Parallel names, locations, and concepts. Once I understood the system that the Flavians were using to link Jesus and Titus, I was able to discover dozens of these parallels between Jesus and Titus. And what was amazing is that they occurred in the same sequence. And this simply proves that this was deliberate, that these unusual parallels had been created by the Flavians as a signature. It is their way of telling posterity that they authored the Gospels. These parallels are the Flavian signature of the Gospels. Duplicates. Both Jesus and Titus began their campaigns at the Sea of Galilee and then go into the Galilean countryside, followed by a journey to Jerusalem. Once they reach the city's outskirts, they pause for a period before they enter. Finally, they leave the city where their campaigns come to an end. To catalog the many parallels, I gave each one a convenient name that 
related to the concept in that particular parallel set. Starting at Galilee, each of these are episodes that occurred both in the Gospel story of Jesus and in the history of Titus's military campaign. Both Jesus and Titus journey to Jerusalem, each sending messengers ahead to meet him when he gets to the city. When the Romans get to Jerusalem, they notice that the Jewish factions are fighting against themselves. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus talks about a house divided against itself cannot stand. Then Josephus wrote that in preparation for battle, Titus ordered all of the fruit trees between the Roman camp and the walls of Jerusalem cut down. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus states that if a fruit tree does not bear good fruit, cut it down. Titus goes around the walls of Jerusalem looking for the best place to construct a tower from which they can launch their attack. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus asks, which one of you who is going to build a tower doesn't first sit down and think about the cost? At this point in the history, Titus sends Josephus to ask the Jews what terms they will accept for peace. In the Gospels, Jesus describes a king who sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. Both Jesus and Titus at this point have triumphant entrances into Jerusalem, during which, amazingly, stones are said to cry out. Each then drives a den of thieves out from the area in front of the temple. This is followed by Titus encircling Jerusalem with a wall and Jesus predicting that Jerusalem will be encircled with a wall. Because of the wall, starvation sets in in Jerusalem. Josephus wrote that a woman named Mary, who called her son a myth for the world, slayed him, ate him, thereby turning him into a human Passover lamb. Mm. In the Gospels, we now have the Last Supper. Mm. Jesus tells his disciples, take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood, thereby turning him into a human Passover lamb. Here, then, is the Flavian signature of their authorship of the Gospels. You can see the fingerprints, that they've left their fingerprints all over these texts. You can start to, as it were, decode uh, these texts and uh, start to arrive at some really startling conclusions about how early Christianity first arose. Our scholars have shown that the Gospels were not the product of primitive Jewish fishermen. Rather, they are a sophisticated literary work combining religious ideas of the day with Roman political perspective and power. Joseph Atwell's research reveals that reading the works of Josephus concurrently with the New Testament shows that the events of Jesus' life were not historical, but rather all of them are dependent on the events and the military campaign of Titus Flavius. Jesus Christ was an allegory for the Roman Caesar Titus, the Messiah of the Roman Empire, the Roman son of a god that Christianity was set up to worship. I certainly don't want to undermine the positive things in Christianity. I'm happy to admit that there are positive things in Christianity and in other religions as well. Well, there's positive people. We got family, man, all, all throughout this hijack, man. And it's not that Christianity makes them positive and negative, but sometimes you got great people, man, that's just being hijacked, man. So all we can do is say, look, man, here's your foundation legend. Here's the, uh, you know what I'm saying? Here's the necromancy, man. Here's the sorcery. Here's the spell. Now you choose up. What's at issue here are the historical claims of these religions. 
Traditionally, religious dogma has forbidden the examination of historical discoveries or the inclusion of certain scientific findings in their teachings, asking their followers instead to blindly believe as they say, not as the objective facts may show. We live in a time, perhaps it's a new intellectual renaissance, which is getting fed up with many of the structures that we live with and which is recognizing major frauds at the heart of our financial markets and the heart of heart of our industry and the plug is being pulled on them. And my view is that we have yet another fraud, the biggest of them all, and it's a fraud at the heart of Christianity. And it is a time for whistleblowers to come out and to make this information available not just to scholars in academic journals, but to have it widely available to anybody who wants to know. It's helpful to hear a wide diversity of voices in order for people to arrive at their own conclusions, and the theories brought forth by our scholars are a part of that diversity. When they hear that the Jesus story is a myth, people feel that you're taking something away, but you're really not. You push people and you go, why do you believe in historical Jesus? Often people will go, well, you know, the Bible or something. But when you go, well, have you studied it as an historical document? Have you looked at the evidence? They'll go, well, no, I haven't. So that's not the real reason. The real reason when you push people is, well, I have a relationship with Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Jesus, and that's what I don't want to lose. And that's a really good reason to be a Gnostic and a really bad reason to be a literalist. The Gnostics, as well as pre-Christian pagan mystery schools, believed that the myth of the dying and resurrecting God-man was an allegory to be used for personal growth, to die to their lower nature and arise to their higher nature. The literalists took control of the original myth and shaped it so it would take the power away from the individual and place it into a central authority. Rediscovering the original myth gives people the freedom to choose the beliefs that truly serve them. Okay, some Christians have developed their personal faith to the extent that Christ is this energy or force or power within them. This is how they have interpreted the story now. The story has become again what it actually began as, an allegory. I have no issue with the Christ within. I have an issue with the, with the church militant. What threatens humanity is organized, regimentized religion on the march, taken so seriously that you will act out its worst precepts. If we examine all the religions of the world, we find that there is a common thread that connects all faiths and all people. And it is from this connection that we can make the choices that have now become so critical to our future. I like to focus on the origins of religious ideas. And it turns out that they're very unifying underneath uh, all of the divisiveness that we see on the surface. It would be extremely helpful for all of humanity to realize that there is this underlying unity. And those origins are basically nature worship, the study of the sun, the moon, the stars, planets. This is all what humanity has been looking at, of course, with great awe and reverence for thousands of years. And it's extremely important, I think, for us to get back to those roots. The destruction of the planet is also directly tied to religious ideas. This can help to restore balance to the planet in a very, very profoundly significant way. The very survival of humanity depends on viewing history from a new perspective so that we can be clearer on the historical facts and still honor the myths that offer us the greatest wisdom. It's uh, what the myth, what the poetry says that matters, uh, not what actually actually happen. So each new generation, whatever you say, is going to hear the myth, and that's what is true for them. And what follows is uh, uh, the actual history is much too complex for the average person to ever get their head around. Though the actual history is complex, and we may never know all the facts about what happened 2,000 years ago, 
the voices of our scholars are contributing to an ever-widening dialogue and the growing paradigm shift being witnessed all around the world today that can lead to a more empowered and enlightened humanity tomorrow. This is really important for our culture to understand where Christianity came from. And this is direct evidence. You can actually walk this path and come to this conclusion. You can know that Christianity was an invention of the Romans. It was done to pacify their subjects. And this is important because it gives us a different way of understanding government, how government operates, the tools that government uses, the purpose that government has for the various propaganda apparatus. Evangelical Christians are getting away with debunking facts as mere theories, even subjects like evolution, but they provide no evidence for their position other than to simply cite religious dogma. And if you look at the influence that dogma is having in the media today, you can easily see it is increasing. I would like to challenge these extremists to consider the possibility that my findings are correct. Though there is much good in Christianity, we have to understand how rulers have used it to control us. And how there is no good in Christianity. It has hijacked you. It has taken you away from being tribal. It has taken your land. It has converted you or it has killed you. It has taken you out of your ancient love song and given you a new tune. And as we tune up, we suit up and we tribe up. How they are still using it to control us today. I hope citizens will be more skeptical when they hear an authority figure using faith to interpret laws or a belief in Armageddon to create governmental policies. The Flavians encoded a secret message into the Gospels, which we can now understand in a new light. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Oh, wow. got that man again dig on the library because it's gonna have all the connections man for you and anytime you got some drop to drop and you want to drop it on drop nation you know what i mean either you can come over here to the right you know click on drop it man that'll take you right into our folder to drop it on us you know what i mean love to this teacher i don't know who did this but i found this script i was able to encode it into our uh our wordpress site and uh yeah man it's a google dropbox man so hey who who would have thunk it but yeah you know so i linked this to our uh, google drive so when you drop us a file it goes directly into our google drive love to everybody with that drop tuna package and uh yeah you know after this i'll be tuning some tunes up getting those to you man so you got them for the shabbat keep dropping it on and sign into the site get your five free songs every month we tune for the community five songs a month <clears throat> and if you uh got that five dollar a month package we do 50 songs a month to get your drop to get your library you know what i'm saying tuned up to the drop tuned up to that four three two yeah you know i mean so let's go let's go let's just uh let's get it right here again you know what i'm saying we got some of this piece so got some of this piece so the jesus story was deliberately written in such a way that it would fulfill the prophecies. The prophecies fit Jesus for the same reason Cinderella's slippers fit her feet. Josephus came only in literature, that is, in Piso's own writings, Peso Piso, under his fictional name, Flavius Josephus. He also wrote, during these approximate years, the following. The Jewish War, Jewish Antiquities, he purportedly, or purported autobiography, his purported autobiography entitled Vita in Latin, which would be Bios in Greek, which is also fictional, the Contra Apinonum, so these are all things to dig on, get all these in the library, so we can see where the cat is coming from. 
Piso is known publicly in history under only under the pen name Flavius Josephus. He is Piso Arius Calpurnius Piso. He does not as, appear as Arius Calpurnius Piso. His pen name is Flavius Josephus. His true identity is decipherable only by reconstruction. With his father's death at Nero's hands in 65, the Pisos vanish from public Roman history. So they go, you know what I'm saying? They they uh, reinvent themselves. They don't go away. They just go and reinvent themselves. You got a lot of people behind the scenes that have reinvented themselves or just become, you know, purposely obscure for the next 73 years. They are busy writing. So his family goes underground. They vanish. And for the next 73 years, man, they are busy writing the New Testament and tightening their power over the known world. So the Pisos, <laughs> after they vanish from Roman history, for the next 73 years, they are busy writing the New Testament and tightening their power over you, Negro. Now you're a Christian following their writings which are nothing but syncretinized linkings of your foundation legend when we dig on the Mossack. But they appear under alias names. They reappear as a family with peace with Piso's grandson, Antonius, as emperor in 138. And are thereafter known chiefly as the Antonines, but not the Pisos. Antonis, not the Pisos. The Jews or Hebrews reject the story. <laughs> so they, you know, you dig on this, man. And you're going to get into this very interesting, you know, Eleazar, Benier, this whole Gospel of Mark, and how the story's being rejected. You know what I mean? Scroll through this for you. This is the authorship of the New Testament book. So this actually gives you the actual author of each book in the New Testament. The original Mark was written by Lucius Calpurnius Piso. The present Mark was written by Arius Calpurnius Piso. Matthew was written by Arius Calpurnius Piso. Luke was written by Arius Calpurnius Piso with Pliny's help. The book of John was written by Justus Calpurnius Piso. These are a family of writers hijacking you, putting you into a spell. Acts of the Apostles, written by A.C. Piso with Justice's help. Romans, the book of Romans was written by Proculus Calpurnius Piso. Proculus. First Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians was written by Pliny. Ah. Corinthians the second and Ephesians was written by Justice Piso. These are all the Pisos. Colossians was written by Justice with his son Julianus. Help. First Timothy was written by Pliny and Second Timothy by Justice, man. Wait, there's more. Titus was written by Pliny. There's a book called Titus in your new test. And you ain't asked no question how this refers to Titus, Caesar, Rome. Just look at this, man. All the places, all Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. These are their family names. Galatians, Gaul. These are their names, man. Their books named after them. And you think it refers to you? But they do have a book called Hebrews written by Flavius Arian, Arianus. Arian, a.k.a. Apion, younger grandson of Piso by Claudia Phoebe. You think it's play play? The book of Revelation was written by Julius. The book of Jude was written by Julius. First, second, and third John was written by Julius Copernicus Piso. First and second Peter was written by Proculus. The book of James was written by Justice. Philemon was written by Justice with the help of Julius. And you know, Titus was written by Pliny, man. Man, the Septuagint father too was busy. Piso was amending the Greek Septuagint. So Piso was amending the Septuagint. In his Gospels, he had strengthened his story by misquoting places from the Hebrew scripts. He changed language in the Septuagint to make it conform with New Testament misquotes. 
That way they would be an alleged correction translation of the Hebrew scripture. So they're correcting it, right? What does everybody say about the Quran? Oh, it's correcting it. Well, you don't need correction when you get back to the root. With which the New Testament quotations agree, the Apocrypha. Peace so wished to create a strong foundation on which to place the new faith. So be between 100 and 115, he recreated the story of the 400 lost years of Jewish history. He did this by also writing most of the 14 books of the Apocrypha, including Edris, Maccabees, Judith, Tobit, Baal, and the Dragon. By making Jewish history brave and glorious, the emperor's people would more readily accept it as their own history. So he kind of redid it to make it a little braver so that he can further hijack the real Hebrews. So he said, hmm, look at all these great triumphant stories. They'll dig on this. Someone told me, man, Maccabees ain't lining up with the Ruach. And I was like, oh, you know, well, maybe that's because <laughs> something else is going on. By making Jewish history brave and glorious, the emperor's people would be more readily accepted as their own history. The Negroes will accept it because it's braver, because you are the bravest. And become the new Israel. They needed a new Negro. They took your kingdoms, your principalities, right? Man. <clears throat> then we got the numeric code systems, man, the numbering. All that is there for you, man. This gets deep, man, with the numbers. So dig on that, man. Let's make our dismount, man, with this. Uh, let's dig on this a little bit for a couple more minutes on the creation of the prophet Muhammad. Now, when we dig on our chronology, and remember, when we talk chronology, the picture that emerges from this, as discovered by scientists and his followers, we're talking for the Manco, is that practically all of your story, which is attributed to dates earlier than 900, consists of duplicates. But the originals, man, your original story is found in the time frame 900 to 1600. So anything they put before 900 any of the story of history, not just Christianity, all hijack history, including Muhammad, that's, you're not exempt. You go hand in hand through the creation of this Vatican in this time period, 900 and 1600. Because if the birth of their Christ is 1054, what do we say? That's year one. Anatoly Fermenko also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 A.D., the so-called fundamental shift in time of 1,053 years in the chronology is implied as year one in accordance with Christ's birth. So the true chronology has this Mashiach being born in 1054, and they started that as year one. And that's how they added a thousand years. 1054 is year one. So the original happened between 900 and 1600. In particular, each event described in a contemporary text like the Quran or the Biblios as having happened earlier than 900. Oh, Muhammad was born in 500 or was Muhammad born between 900 and 1600? is a concatenation, a linking together of several later events. So when they try to give you anything earlier than 900, it is just a linking of later events that happen later when between 900 and 1600. So again, when they say Muhammad was born around 500 and something, was he actually born? And love to the fan that dropped this on me. Is he the Arabi? That was born between 1165 and 1240. Now, why would we say that? Because they're pretty much just giving you this shit. They're telling you this. They're letting you know it right in your face. This Arabi can be considered the greatest of all Muslim philosophers. What? That already validates a claim 
that this is a comparable figure. Whether it is or not, we're just asking the question. I'm not here to sway you this and that. We have to bring it up because it's in between the 900 and 1600. And we can't take a date of a birth of this Muhammad at 500 when we know they're duplicating and putting it into the past to add time. To act like they are more established and have a foundation with you. So this Arabi can be considered the greatest of all Muslim philosophers. All Muslim philosophers. The greatest of all time. Provided we understand philosophy in the broad modern sense and not simply as the discipline of Falsafa, whose outstanding representatives are Evin Evi Sinna and many would say Mullah Sandra, Western scholarship, and much of the later Islamic tradition have classified Arabi as a Sufi, though he himself did not, his works cover the whole gamut of Islamic sciences, not not least Quran commentary, hadith, hadith, sayings of Muhammad, <laughs> jurisprudence, principles of jurisprudence, theology, philosophy, and mysticism, unlike Al-Ghazali, whose range of work is similar to Arabi, he did not usually write in specific genres, but tended rather to integrate and synthesize the sciences syncretinize link them together include a little bit of this with a little bit of that integrate and synthesize kind of reminds me of the philo philo character the sciences in the context of thematic works ranging in length from one or two folios to several thousand pages nor did he depart from the highest level of discourse or repeat himself in different works. The later Sufi tradition called him a al Shaikh, al Gabar, Akbar, the greatest master, a title that was understood to mean that no one else has been or will be able to unpack the multi layer significance of the sources of the Islamic tradition with such detail and prof profundity. Profound profundity. Wow. So this Arabi is also called the greatest master. He's also called the greatest of all Muslim philosophers. <laughs> He's also called Muhammad. His name is also Muhammad. He is Muhammad. And he's called the greatest master. Wow, what does that mean? You don't really hear about this one, huh? But he, in their circle, is known as the greatest. Arabi's writings remain unknown in the West until modern times. <laughs> but they spread throughout the Islamic world without, within a century of his death, the earlier Orientalist, with one or two exceptions, paid little attention to him because he had no discernible influence in Europe. His works, moreover, are notoriously difficult, making it easy to dismiss him as a mystic or a pantheist without trying to read him, not until books by Henry Corbin or Tashiko Itz Itzutsu. Was he recognized as an extremely broad ranging and highly original thinker or original thinker? <clears throat> so he wasn't acting like that Muhammad or this Muhammad. He was original. He was the greatest because this title, you know, what I'm saying was understood to mean that no one else has been able to unpack the multi layered significance of the sources that he's kicking as an original thought. This is the Muhammad Muhammad. Talking about broad ranging, right? Man, so you got this. We're talking about divine speech. Deformity. Fixed entities. The reality of realities. The circle of existence. The perfect man. The station of no station. Human perfection. These were his philosophies, and it sounds a lot like that, Muhammad, right? We're just talking about the creation of the Prophet Muhammad. And although they try to put it around this 500 range, you know, again, I'll leave this man, you know, this is this Jesuit priest, you know, dropping his drop about the power of darkness, this Augustine B.I. I know it's small, you know, we're just going to get a little bit of it. Hey. Yeah. 
In a Vatican briefing, Cardo B had told us a story. A wealthy Arabian lady who was the faithful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama, the creation. This this Muhammad went to school, highly educated. That Muhammad went to school and is highly educated. It's the same person. It's a duplicate, a phantom. We found another one, Love to Drop Nation. She was a widow of Khadija. She gave her wealth to the church and retired to a convent. But was given an assignment. She was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. I know it's more. You know, pull it up, dig on it, man. So she, this Arabian lady, told by this Carl Cardinal Bia. She found herself a brilliant young man that can be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Israel. Ishmael, not Israel. Ishmael. Israel's never had a leader outside of Israel. We've never had a prophet outside of our tribes. Now here's a prophet, a Messiah from another tribe. We're still talking Caesar's Messiah. Khadijah had a cousin named Rawakwa, who was very faithful. All right, so it goes through this whole thing. Muhammad instructed some of them to flee to Abyssinia, where Negus, the Roman Catholic king, is this is this Esau? <laughs> is this King James? <laughs> Accepted them because Muhammad's view on the Virgin Mary were so close to Rome. And so when you push this to the twelve hundreds, man, then you got the these melanated Black ass King James and Charles's and all them. They are the ones pulling the strings to create for these tribes of Ishmael. We're just talking the Confederacy Psalms 83 against you. They put you to sleep. Muhammad claimed he had a vision from Allah and was told you are the messenger of Allah. Same thing this other Muhammad is talking about. This Muhammad has visions and divine, you know, divine speech and all that. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies in exchange for three favors. All right. The Pope moved quickly and issued bulls, papal bulls, granting Arab generals permission to invade and conquer the nations of North America. Oh, no, man. We're just talking about the papal bull, Dumb Diverses, 1452. Doom die verses. You know, I'm just going to leave it for you. We read it many of times. But this is the Papa Bull. And what does he say? We weighing all in singular the premises with due meditation and noting that since we have formally by other letters of ours granted among things free in apple faculty to the aforesaid King Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Negroes with their calling Saracens and pagans whatsoever and other enemies of Christ, wheresoever place and take their kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them to reduce their persons to perpetual forever slavery and to apply and appropriate to himself, take their shit, and you can have all the... All the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and convert them to his or their use, slavery, and profit. So he gave them permission to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue you Negroes. And what are we reading here? That the Pope moved quickly and issued papal bulls, granting the Arab generals. Wow. Wow. Same invasion, papal bulls, the popes behind this, the popes behind that. Permission to what? Invade and conquer the nations. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies in exchange for three favors. One, eliminate the Jews and Christians. The latter were regarded as true believers. They were called infidels. So the Jews and Christians were regarded as the true believers. We're not talking about the modern Christian. We're talking about the Nestorian. Nestor, they called it. Nestorian, old king renowned for wisdom, 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 wise counsel. You come from kings of wisdom. You come from Solomon's and priest kings. 
Well, they called Christians, so they wanted to eliminate you. They also called you what? Saracens. Invade, search out, capture, vanquish all Saracens and pagans. <laughs> you remember all the different branches of what they're calling this Christianity, right? Eliminate the Jews, eliminate the Negroes, eliminate the Hebrews. Two, protect the Augustian monks and Roman Catholics. Oh, they wanted their protection. They needed protection, these Arabs, to help protect them. This seems like a different part of history, right? Because you thought it was just them against them. But in reality, they're working together through the Vatican. They need protection from these Arabs to do what? Find you. Go get Prester John. Go take down the kingdoms. Go invade them. Search them out and capture and put them in what? Perpetual slavery. That's forever, which is why you're a prisoner of war today, Negro. And number three, here's the help that the Vatican's going to get from Islam. Conquer Jerusalem for his holiness in the Vatican. They needed them to help conquer you where? Conquer you here. And when they conquered you here, they got you, right? When they conquered you here, they got you, right? Where's my library? Where's my library? <laughs> oh, it's my old library. Look at that. Still got the link for that. That's cool, right? Huh? Yeah, man, when they conquered you here, they got you, right? Welcome to Swag Frequency. Welcome to Swag Frequency, baby. Yeah, this is part four. This is the finale, man. I love y'all. <laughs> Number three, what did they do? They, they needed the help to take you out, take your kingdom. What did Columbus tell you in the Biblioteca de Columbina in Sevilla, Spain? Among the earliest and most fascinating witnesses to the latter manuscript. Of 84 pages or folios dated September 13, 1501 to March 23. And now preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Sevilla. It begins, this is the book, beginning of the book or collection of authorities, authorities, sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city. This is Columbus, man. He's recovering the city where? Where he's going? Here. And Mount Zion. And the discovery and conversion of the islands of the Indies. In case you thought this was play. They came here to do what? Recover the holy city in Mount Zion. They came to the islands of the Indies to do what? Recover the holy city. <coughs> they came here to recover the holy city and Mount Zion. The islands of the Indies and all peoples and nations for Ferdinand and Isabella. They came to the Indias, Indies, take out the priest king of the three Indias, Prester John. They took out the priest king, the Grand Khan, the Israelite kings. To do what? Recover or conquer their holy city. And what do we just read? That the Vatican needed Islam's help to do what? Conquer Jerusalem for his holiness. That's what the papal bulls are all about. The Pope moved quickly and issued bulls granting the Arab generals permissions to invade and conquer the nations of North Africa. <laughs> now, this is Africa according to them, right? This is a Mexum according to them, right? Psalms 83, man. It's all about a confederacy. It's all about a confederacy. Hawa, do not remain silent, do not turn a deaf ear, do not stand aloof. Hawa, see how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads with cunning. They conspire against your people, Hawa. They plot against those you cherish, Hawa. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance, a confederacy against you, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites and the Moabites and Hagrites. 
The Biblos, Ammon, Amalek, Philistine, the people of Tyre, even Assyria has joined them to reinforce Lot's descendants. Let us take possession of the pasture lands of Hawa. Let us take possession of the promised land. Let us recover the holy city. This is the confederacy in real time and in real life. This is the alliance against you. We're talking Ishmael. We're talking Edom. We're talking Ishmael and we're talking Edom. I said we're talking Ishmael and we're talking Edom. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies. The Vatican, Edom, used Islam, the Ishmaelites, to do what? Eliminate the Hebrews, keep them safe, and conquer the holy city. And if you ain't digging on it, if you ain't digging on it by now, man, it's, you know, it's only so much we can do, you know what I'm saying? But we're leading you to the water. We're getting you in there, man. We're all coming back. We're all coming back to life, man. And love to all y'all for surfing the wave. Thank you for uh, enjoying this four-part series here. You choose up. You choose your Joshua. You come here to Drop Nation. The password is 1234. You drop your drop. You subscribe. You get all that all the passwords, all the drop, you get your music tuned up. Support J. Stu's baby fun, man. J. Stu got a young one on the way, man. So you can click here to support the stewards. And we'll be dropping that drop, man. We'll be dropping that drop. We just set a little $5,000 goal, man, just to kind of get them some comfort space and see what we can do as a nation to be a wall of protection for our tribe. We love y'all. Stay hijack free. Stay up. Suit up. Choose up. Drop nation.